Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to continue talking about the graph convolutions and today we will look into the second part where we now see whether we can stay in this spectral domain or whether we can also go back to spatial domain. So let's look what I have for you. So you remember we had this polynom that we used in order to define a convolution in spectral domain and we've seen that by computing the eigenvectors of the Laplacian matrix we were able to find an appropriate Fourier transform that would then give us a spectral representation of the graph configuration. Then we could do our convolution in spectral domain and transform back. Now this was kind of very expensive because we have to compute u and for u we have to do the eigenvalue decomposition for this entire symmetric matrix and so on and also we've seen that we can't use tricks of the fast Fourier transform because this doesn't necessarily hold for our ut. So how can we choose now k and theta in order to get rid of u? Well so if we choose k equals to 1, theta 0 to 2 theta and theta 1 to minus theta, we get the following polynomial. So we still have the configuration that we have x transformed into Fourier space times our polynomial expressed as matrix times the inverse Fourier transform here. Now let's look into the configuration of g hat. g hat can actually be expressed as 2 times theta times lambda to the power of zero. Remember, lambda is a diagonal matrix, so we take every element to the power of zero. So this is actually a unity matrix. And we subtract theta times lambda to the power of one. Well, this is actually just lambda. And then we can express our complete matrix G hat in this way. Of course, we can then pull in our u from the left hand side and the right hand side which is giving us the following expression. Now we use the property that theta is actually a scalar so we can pull it to the front. The lambda to the power of zero cancels out because this is essentially just an identity matrix and the lambda on the right hand side term still remains but we can also pull out the theta. Well the u, u transpose just cancels out. So this is again the identity matrix. And we can use our definition of the symmetric version of our graph Laplacian. And you can see that we've just find it here in our equation. So we can also replace it with this one. And you see now u is suddenly gone. So we can pull out theta again and all that remains is that we have two times the identity matrix minus the symmetric version of the graph Laplacian. If we now plug in the definition of the symmetric version associated to the original adjacency matrix and the degree matrix, we can see that we still can plug this definition in. Then one of the identity matrices cancels out and we finally get identity plus d to the power of minus 0.5 times a times d to the power of minus 0.5. So remember d is a diagonal matrix so we can easily invert the elements on the diagonal and we can also take element wise the square root. So this is perfectly fine. So this way we don't have u at all coming up here and we can express our entire graph convolution in this very nice way using the graph Laplacian matrix. Now let's analyze this term a little more. So we can see this identity on the left hand side we see we can convolve x in spectral domain and we can construct g hat as a polynomial of Laplacian filters. Then we can see with a particular choice k equals 1 and theta 0 equals to 2 theta and theta 1 equals to minus theta, 
then this term suddenly only depends on the scalar value theta. And with all these tricks, we got rid of the Fourier transform U transpose. Huh? So we suddenly can express graph convolutions in this simplified way. Well, this is the basic graph convolution operation, and you can find this actually shown in reference number one. You can essentially do this with a scalar value. You use your degree matrix and plug it in here. You use your adjacency matrix and you plug it in here. And then you can optimize with respect to theta in order to find the weight for your convolutions. Well, now the question is, is it really necessary to motivate the graph convolution from spectral domain? And the answer is no. So we can also motivate it spatially as well. So let's look at the following concept. For a mathematician, a graph is a manifold, but a discrete one. We can discretize the manifold and do spectral convolution using the Laplacian matrix. So this led us to spectral graph convolutions. But as computer scientists, you can interpret a graph as a set of nodes and vertices connected through edges. And we now need to define how to aggregate the information of one vertex through its neighbors. And if we do so, we get spatial graph convolution. Well, how is this done? One approach shown in reference two is graph sage. And here we essentially define a vertex of interest and we define how neighbors contribute to the vertex of interest. So technically we implement this using a feature vector at the node V in the kth layer and this can be described as HKV. So for the zero of layer this contains the input. So this is just the original configuration of your graph. And then we need to be able to aggregate in order to compute the next layer. And this is done by using a special aggregation function over the previous layer. And therefore you use all of the neighbors. And typically you define this neighborhood such that every node that is connected to the node under consideration is included in this neighborhood. So this then brings us to the graph sage algorithm. So here you start with a graph and input features and then you do the following algorithm. So you initialize at H0 with simply the input of the graph configuration and then you iterate over the layers and you iterate over the nodes. For every node you run the aggregation function that somehow computes a summary over all of your neighbors. Then the result is a vector of a certain dimension and you then take the aggregated vector and the current configuration of the vector, you concatenate them and multiply them with a weight matrix. And this is then run through a nonlinearity. Lastly, you then still scale by the magnitude of your activations. And this is then iterated over all of the layers. And finally, you get the output Z that is the result of your graph convolution. So the concept of aggregators is key to develop this algorithm because in every node you may have a different number of neighbors. So a very simple aggregator would then be simply computing the mean. Of course, you can also take the GCN aggregator and this then brings us back to the spectral representation and the connection between spatial and spectral can be established. You can take a pooling aggregator, which then uses, for example, maximum pooling, or you use recurrent networks like an LSTM aggregator. And you already see that there's broad variety of aggregators. And this is then also the reason why there are so many different graph deep learning approaches. But you can subdivide them into certain kinds because there is spectral ones, there is spatial ones, and there are the recurrent ones. So this is essentially the key how you can tackle the graph convolutional neural networks. So what do we actually want to do? Well, you can then take one of these algorithms and apply it to some mesh. And of course, this can also be done on very complex meshes. And 
I will put a couple of references that you can see what kind of applications can be done. For example, you can use it in order to process information on coronary arteries. Well, next time in deep learning, there's only a couple of topics left. And one thing that I want to show to you is how you can embed prior knowledge into deep networks. And this is also a quite nice idea because it allows us to fuse much of the things that we know from theory and signal processing with our deep learning approaches. Of course, I also have a couple of references. And if you have some time, please read through them. They elaborate much more closely the ideas that we presented here. And there's also image references that I'll put into the description of this video. So thank you very much for listening and see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.